Today's video is brought to you by Magic Spoon. If you've watched my channel before, you'll know that I'm a big fan of cereal because who isn't? Cereal is fantastic, but what it's not is fantastic for you. There were several years where I never ate cereal much because it usually just has way too much sugar that I just don't need in my life. I just don't know. I mean, I don't have the healthiest diet in the world, but generally I feel like I keep an okay shape by not eating too much sugar, not eating too many unnecessary carbs. Anyway, along come Magic Spoon and they're like, yo, Simon, check this out. Loads of protein. Right there, 12 grams, mm-hmm. Three grams of net carbs, oh, this one has four grams of net carbs. Different boxes, different amounts. And uh, zero grams of sugar, and overall, only 110 calories, that's fantastic. Now look, I don't know much about protein, carbs, other than that stuff, but the zero sugar really had me sold. And it also tastes great, that's important. I'm not gonna shovel more into my mouth right now, but it's just, Tasty, tastes like regular delicious cereal. It's also keto friendly, gluten free, low carb, all that good stuff. Now, originally they had four flavors cocoa, fruited, frosted, and blueberry, but recently they've launched a whole bunch more. Cinnamon and peanut butter, I think, came next, and that was when I discovered my favorite peanut butter. Then later came these other two ones cookies and cream, maple, maple waffle, also great. The great thing what they've done is you can now go build yourself a personalized cereal box of custom flavors, which is very cool. Anyway, click the link below or go to magicspoon.com forward slash brain food to grab a variety pack and try it all out. Use my code brain food to get $5 off. And Magic Spoon also has a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it, you get your money back. And now today's video. 2,700 years or so ago, the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal was initiating a program to gather copies of all books in his empire to his library. Bookworm would have been an apt description for him had books not been made of clay, making them slightly undesirable to worms. Anyway, back to good old Ashurbanipal. He liked to boast about having complete mastery of all scribal arts. In his own words, I, Ashurbanipal, within the palace, understood the wisdom of Nabu, the god of learning, all the art of writing of every kind. I made myself the master of them all. I read the cunning tablets of Sumer and the dark Akkadian language, which is difficult to rightly use. I took my pleasure in reading stones inscribed before the flood, such works as none of the kings who went before me had ever learned remedies, clever teachings. I wrote on tablets, checked and collated and deposited within my palace for perusing and reading. So, let's say he wasn't shy about being a bit of a nerd. That said, if you're picturing him wearing thick glasses and a bow tie, remember that he liked hunting lions for sport. That said, he used his prodigious learning and nerdery to good end, ruling what, according to many scholars, constitutes one of the first true empires in the world due to its administrative innovations. Its dominion reached Egypt to the west and Iran to the east, and dear nerdy Ashurbanipal was heralded by his subjects as equal to the gods. Of course, in our time, overly obsessing over knowledge and intellectual things is often associated with social awkwardness and introvertedness. And the culmination of all of this is the very definition of what we would call a nerd. Or is it? To begin with, what exactly makes a nerd a nerd? Is it the obsession with a certain theme, like knowing everything about a specific genre, such as all spaceship types in Star Trek, or the stats of the already alarming and still growing number of Pokemon, or perhaps religiously going to Comic-Con dressed up accordingly? But a sportsman might know everything about his favorite sport, talk about the last match all week long, and go to the stadium dressed up as his favorite football player, but he's not considered a nerd. But at the core, is there really any difference? In the public consciousness, probably, as his interests are not categorized as nerdy, but how did this come to be? Emerging in a Dr. Seuss book in 1950, the word nerd found its way into slang. More specifically, the first documented case of nerd was in Dr. Seuss's If I Ran the Zoo. The specific text was a knuckle, a nerd, and a seersucker too. It was just over a year after the Dr. Seuss book in 1951 in a Newsweek magazine article that we find the first documented case of nerd being used similarly to how we use it today. That's being synonymous with someone who was a drip or a square. There are two popular hypotheses as to where the word derived from. The first is that it was perhaps derived from drunk, spelled backwards, knurd. This was fitting to describe people who studied instead of going out with friends and partying. A somewhat more popular hypothesis 
hypothesis suggests that it came from a modification of nut, specifically nerd, which meant stupid or crazy person and was common in the 1940s, directly before the term nerd showed up. Whatever the case, the word nerd ended up becoming relatively popular in the 1960s and the 1970s and was hugely popularized by the TV show Happy Days, where it was used frequently. Wherever it derived from exactly, it was used as a sort of shorthand to refer to students in schools or other people who were socially awkward and obnoxiously intelligent, mostly in the fields of maths and science. But the meaning quickly changed into a type of slur that could apply to someone even if they didn't have the social characteristics of a nerd, but were, for example, super interested in books and learning. For middle school children, ultimately being dubbed a geek or nerd is still not always welcome. In fact, evidence indicates that such epithets lead children to underachieve purposely to avoid these labels, especially with girls. As to why the stigma, the obvious explanation is that this is related to the teenage psychology of rebellion against authority figures, which includes teachers and the school systems in general. Those good at the subjects taught and those who become the favorite of the teachers are therefore regarded as uncool, particularly if to a wide range of students the subject seems not very applicable in real life and therefore causes utter confusion and subsequent rejection in order to avoid feeling stupid. Of course, the number of reasons why nerds are sometimes unpopular is decidedly large, since can be easily linked to things like anti-intellectualism as well as simple stereotypical social awkwardness at times, but our interest here lies primarily in the evolution of the implied theme from kings associated with gods for their intellectual prowess to the modern day stereotypical physically and socially fragile intellectuals. On this note, the drastic stereotype is especially strange since for most of history, the bullies, i.e. the various warlords in history, predominantly love to be or be thought of was what essentially boils down to nerds. If we look at history's champion of the nerds, Plato, founder of the Academy and promoter of philosophy, music, and mathematics, we can read that he was an accomplished wrestler. Actually, and prepare for your mind to be a little bit blown here, the name Plato is just a nickname allegedly given to him by his wrestling coach, meaning broad because of his stature. One of his ideas, prolifically described in his work The Republic, was that the perfect ruler should be a philosopher king. So, not surprisingly, the nerd wanted the world to be ruled by nerds. But this type of role model should also be strong and have a built body, since it was believed that the outer image reflects the mind controlling it. Plato's teacher, the philosopher Socrates, is also portrayed as having shown great bravery and valor as a soldier in the Battle of Potidaea in 432 BC, balancing his spiritual greatness as a thinker. This mentality has survived in various axioms, such as a healthy mind and a healthy body. So, it's not surprising that in the movie Man of Steel, young Clark Kent reads The Republic while being bullied by kids from school. Okay, but all that concerns people with a tendency towards knowledge. What about the bullies? How did they manifest in the old days, those warlords and rulers? And were they actually the same people we might classify as nerds? A strange concept, that of the nerdy bully, but nonetheless apt in this case. Well, the tendency to show off and shout one's prowess to everyone is probably as old as humanity. Today, this is done with Instagram photos, then with statues and speeches. Within the literary civilizations, this would sometimes be transposed in an effort to show one's intellectual prowess as well. To see how this works, let's look at the land of Sumer. The ruler would build large temples and the like, and of course would show himself doing so in carvings, etc., so that his contemporaries, and we in the future, would admire him for designing and building such a magnificent structure. Even, of course, if the depiction is symbolic and he didn't actually lift a finger himself. For example, here is an example from around 2500 BCE, where King Ernest let himself be portrayed on the upper left corner, carrying a funny basket used by workers to transport bricks. As the building procedure became more complex, the rulers funding the projects were more admired for it. But at the same time, they all knew who was really deserving of the respect. And that was not so much the big guy with the money, but rather the architect, the guy doing all the maths and planning. So much so that one sees some of these early Bronze Age engineers being deified, such as Imhotep, no, not the mummy guy, the architect of the Giza Pyramid. As another example, 300 years after Anashi, one of his successors, Gudea, shows himself participating in the building of the temple, but this time he is holding a plan, fancying himself as an architect. In the same vein, another well-known ruler followed this path, and that was the Roman Emperor Hadrian, personally overtaking the design of many works, such as the Temple of Venus in Rome. Furthermore, kings fancied themselves as king priests. A priest had access to the divine powers and the respect and often fear of the people. Ancient kings would try and 
combine the positions of head of religion and head of state in the same person themselves. So, for example, in Egypt, the pharaoh was the consort of the gods, depicted in relevant sides to them in war carvings. In Rome, ever since Augustus, the Roman emperors, besides being the head of state, would also serve as the pontifex, the head of the priesthood, something that the consuls, the heads of state in the Roman Republic, had not previously done. Of course, for simple, very direct practical reasons, gathering books and knowledge would help expand research in areas such as war, technology, or medicine. So, naturally, the seeking of knowledge in itself became a prestigious affair. Knowledge, as ever, was power. Now, do you remember Ashurbanipal from the intro, the king who prided himself on all the books that he gathered? He was not the only one. Ptolemy in Alexandria, Harun al-Rashid in Baghdad, the Medici in Florence, all kings and dukes who liked to appear refined and civil would sponsor the gathering of books, not only supporting intellectuals, but also trying to be intellectuals with some well-known epic fails such as the Roman Emperor Nero. Moving on from then, since the clash between the Bishop Ambrosius and Emperor Theodosius in the late 400s AD and continuing to medieval times, the responsibility over divine things and also about keeping and expressing opinions about anything concerning knowledge was in the priest's hands again, with books being copied and studied by monks, etc. The king would seek the connection with the divine, but now with exceptions not usually as directly as in the past, where claiming descendancy from a god or being head of the priests himself was all the rage. In slightly more modern times, simply gaining the blessing of the pope or priests was sufficient. The ruler himself would instead tend to focus on building up the image of the capable warrior. So the ideal of Plato, and indeed Clark Kent, to combine wisdom and strength and appreciate both equally, was eventually left behind. Priests would prompt asceticism and focus on the divine. Caring for the appearance of the body was regarded as vanity and generally frowned upon in what we could call the academic world of the day, which was mainly the priesthood. This type of isolated academic, immersed the whole day in his books and never seeing sunshine and exercise, would continue and slowly start to fit the more nerdy stereotype we think of today, the sort of absent-minded, socially awkward professor. With the Renaissance and Enlightenment, the torch of knowledge was transferred to new bearers, the scientists, around which the stereotype of the isolated, obsessive types, and Frankenstein, developed. Although appreciated as the force behind progress, and in cases such as Einstein even becoming celebrities, scientists were even regarded with some arrogance as isolated from the rest of the working class as the type that does not get their hands dirty, or even inept at more practical matters of life, whether that was actually true or not. To the disappointment of ancient philosophers like Plato and Seneca, the search for knowledge was disconnected from the concept of striving to become a complete being and the effort to build oneself physically as well as intellectually. Rather, it became about entering the best, most prestigious university, studying for exams until the best grades were near inevitable, and publishing papers biannually. And let's not forget the time constraints that come with this sort of pressure. With the competitive nature of this academic world, even since school, it therefore seems like the best idea for the so inclined student students to leave behind a potentially rich social life in the hopes of accomplishment in academia, or so goes the stereotype. This all has ultimately culminated in the idea of the bookworm, or nerds generally being skinny, physically weak, glasses wearing, and socially awkward. Among countless other reasons related to the ridiculous shenanigans that occur among school-aged individuals, this has resulted in the label not always a sought-after one, and often even more socially stigmatized among females. This also often sees girls, unfortunately, abandon the sciences and fields like engineering at an early age, even if they have a particularly strong aptitude and interest in them. But that's a major topic for another day. All of this said, all is not lost for the one-time rulers of Earth and now lowly bullied nerds the world over. With the advent of, frankly, kick-ass technologies and other practical and extremely prevalent applications of engineering, maths, and science literally staring us in the face right now as you watch this video, as well as the widespread popularity of comic book heroes and sci-fi and fantasy at an all-time high, being openly nerdy in the modern world is slowly starting to shift back from being a label one would want to avoid as much as possible in order to keep your lunch money to something born as a badge of pride. That's not even to mention the number of nerds who've retaken the mantle of kings of the world via starting various tech and other companies, sometimes within a few years, vaulting themselves by their brains and ultra-nerdy focus into being among the richest people in history, much like their kingly forebears, superiority complexes, 
occasionally are included. And now for a bonus fact. The first documented case of geek dates all the way back to 1916. At the time, the term was used to describe sideshow freaks in circuses. Specifically, it was typically attributed to those circus performers who were known for doing crazy things like biting the heads off of small live animals or eating insects live and things like that. These performances were often called geek shows. The word itself, geek, came from the word geck, which was originally a low German word, which meant someone was a fool, a freak, a simpleton. Before geek, nerd, dork, etc., the proper term for these ragamuffins were dewdroppers, waldos, and slackers. Other old common slang words that are somewhat similar in meaning are panty waste, oil can, drip, stinkeroo, mullet, roach, schnookle, kook, dimp, dwarf, squid, auger, square, joe, zilch, and dud. So, really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.